My name is Daniel Yates, and today I'm going to be talking about A Century of Dishonor by Helen Hunt Jackson. Helen Hunt Jackson was an essayist, author, and humanitarian. Primarily known for her two most famous works, Ramona, a romance novel with a deep interest in the plight of Native Americans, and A Century of Dishonor, a scathing review of the mistreatment of and atrocities against Native Americans in the 1800s. Jackson was born Helen Maria Fisk in Amherst, Massachusetts in the year 1830. Her father was Nathan Welby Fisk, a professor of language and philosophy at Amherst College. She initially had three siblings, two brothers and a sister, but only she and her sister Anne survived infancy. Her highly educated father was able to teach Helen to read and write, and Helen was accepted at a local boarding school, Amherst Academy, where she spent much of her younger years. It was here that she met and became lifelong friends with poet Emily Dickinson. She was transferred to Ipswich Female Seminary School at age 11. In 1844, her mother, Deborah Fisk, died of tuberculosis. Three years later, her father succumbed to the same disease and died. Helen was taken in by her aunt at the age of 17 and transferred to Abbott Boarding School in New York City. She did well in school but had no particular passionate direction. Back then, women were not encouraged to pursue careers. At age 21, Helen married U.S. Army Captain and Mechanical Engineer Edward Bissell Hunt and took his last name. Soon after marriage, they had a son, Murray Hunt, but he died in infancy from brain disease. They had a second son, Warren, in 1855. Eight years later, Edward died in a submarine accident while testing one of his own designs, and two years later, her son Murray died of diphtheria. In her overwhelming grief, she turned to writing. In 1866, she moved to Providence, Rhode Island, and began writing many works. She wrote novels, short stories, poems, and essays. She had, many, she had met many literary friends in New England, and with their help and influence, she really began to turn out piece after piece, always under a pseudonym as women were not published. She eventually settled on H.H. as her pen name. She was ill, however, and fearing she would succumb to the same illnesses as her family, she moved to Colorado Springs in 1874 in the hope that the weather may help. In 1875, she remarried, this time to William Sharpless Jackson, again taking this man's name, an established banker and railroad entrepreneur. She traveled often, but from that point she called Colorado home. I'd like to provide a little bit of context in the background. The 1800s was the era of American exploration and expansion. This is sometimes referred to as Manifest Destiny. There was a massive landscape out west that boasted tremendous value in terms of resources, land, and profit. Nothing was going to stop westward advance by the whites of American colonies, and the only real obstacle they found were the natives who already lived there. Oh, the Americans promised treaties and trades, sure, and once in a while they even came through. But by and large, it was mass murder, disease, rape, and theft that Americans used to rout the natives out. During Helen's many travels, she went to a reception in Boston for the Ponca Native American tribe. Chief Standing Bear spoke about how his tribe was being removed from its native land in Nebraska and relocated to an Oklahoma reservation they would have to share with other tribes. Standing Bear's words hit Helen hard. From that moment on, she would spend all of her remaining years writing and in an instance fighting for Native American rights in America. Helen dedicated herself to researching how America had treated Native Americans and used the next two years on nothing else. She ultimately wrote A Century of Dishonor when her research was complete in 1881. It shames the American government and white settlers for their horror campaigns and countless atrocities upon the native tribes. She describes the mistreatment, the theft, the indifference, the butchery, and overall hostility towards the Amer Native American peoples. I have a few quotes from A Century of Dishonor that I would like to read. There is not among these 300 bands of Indians in the United States one which has not suffered cruelly at the hands of either the government or of white settlers. The poorer, the more insignificant, the more helpless the band, the more certain the cruelty and outrage to which they have been subjected. This is especially true of the bands on the Pacific slopes. These Indians found themselves of a sudden surrounded by and cut up in the great influx of gold-seeking settlers as helpless creatures on a shore are cut up in a tidal wave. There was not time for the government to make treaties, not even time for communities to make laws. The tale of the wrongs, the oppressions, the murders of the Pacific Slope Indians in the last 30 years would be a volume unto itself and is too monstrous to be believed. It makes little difference, however, where one opens the record of the history of the Indians. Every page in every year has its dark stain. The story of one tribe is a story of all, varied only by differences of time and place. 
but neither time nor place makes any difference in the main facts. The history of the government connections with the Indians is a shameful record of broken treaties and unfulfilled promises. The history of the border white man's connection with the Indians is a sickening record of murder, outrage, robbery, and wrongs committed by the former, as the rule, and occasional savage outbreaks and unspeakably barbarous deeds of retaliation by the latter, as the exception. Taught by the government that they had rights entitled to respect, when those rights have been assailed by the rapacity of the white man, the arm which should have been raised to protect them has ever been ready to sustain the aggressor. Every crime committed by a white man against an Indian is concealed or palliated. Every offense committed by an Indian against a white man is borne on the wings of the post or the telegraph to the remotest corner of the land, clothed with all the horrors which the reality or imagination can throw around it. While they continue individually to gather the crumbs that fall from the table of the United States, idleness, improvidence, and indebtedness will be the rule, and industry, thrift, and freedom from debt the exception. The utter absence of individual title to particular lands deprives everyone among them of the chief incentive to labor and exertion, the very mainspring on, on which the prosperity of a people depends. The testimony of some of the highest military officers of the United States is on record to, ref to the effect that, in our Indian wars, almost without exception, the first aggressions have been made by the white man, and the assertion is supported by every civilian of re reputation who has studied the subject. In addition to the class of robbers and outlaws who find impunity in their nefarious pursuits on the frontiers, there is a large class of professedly reputable men who use every means in their power to bring it on Indian wars for the sake of the profit to be realized from the presence of troops and the expenditures of government funds in their midst. They proclaim death to the Indians at all times in words and publications, making no distinction between the innocent and the guilty. Helen Hunt Jackson, at her own expense, sent a copy of A Century of Dishonor to every single congressman, and knowing most would simply discard it, she also sent a copy to every major publication at the time to ensure the public was aware. For the most part, A Century of Dishonor was panned by the government and the powerful who referred to it as soft and sentimental. Many Americans thought Helen was anti-American and shunned her work. However, Century was a spark that created the Indian Rights Association which fought for Native American rights back then and still does today. This work has been used by many Indian rights movements and groups and is considered today one of the most notable resources on the state of Indian affairs up to and after the Civil War. Helen Hunt Jackson wrote A Century of Dishonor to bring awareness to the deep and desperate plight of Native American peoples across the country, a plight brought upon them by the American government and westward expansion. She dedicates seven chapters to seven different tribes and describes their before and after scenarios. She lambasts the military's approach of genocide, the false historical narrative that Indians were savage murderers, the ridiculous notion that those who survived are lady, lazy, disorderly, or otherwise unsuitable for society, and Congress's failure to pass laws that would treat them with dignity and opportunity that each American has a right to. She offers a few possible solutions like citizenship, but warns that citizenship alone is not going to suffice. Sponsored Helen spent a few years in California with a tribe and in 1883 wrote Report on the Conditions and Needs of the Mission Indians of California. While it led to a vote in the Senate on Indian rights, the bill was shut down by the House of Representatives. She decided to write a novel to appear to the general public and wrote her most famous work, Ramona, published in 1884. As a romance novel, it was very successful and is still in publication today. However, readers read it for the romantic content and very little to nothing was noted or changed on the plight of Native Americans and she considered it a failure. She died in San Francisco in 1885 of stomach cancer. Her husband had her buried at the top of Inspiration Point overlooking Colorado Springs, Colorado. Her body was exhumed and buried elsewhere, but her monument remains. Today there are many authors that dedicate their work to the awareness of injustice. One such author is Ta Nehisi Coates. In his book Between the World and Me, he has a distinct section called Letter to My Son. In it he warns his son that being black in America could cost him his life at any moment, and he must be extremely careful and think a step ahead in order to ensure his own safety. Speaking from experience, it is deeply powerful and speaks volumes on the state of the nation. You have an opportunity, I highly suggest that you read this excerpt that I have placed here, or even the section, Letter to My Son, which you can find online. It's very powerful. I believe 
that awareness was Helen Hunt Jackson's goal back in 1881 and 83, and her work can still be a powerful tool for awareness today. America and much of the world remain diabolically locked in prejudicial labeling and intolerance based on race and or skin color, born from some misguided sense of conformity combined with a perpetual insatiable need for what does not belong to us to become ours. So many of us rarely give a thought to those who suffer this way because we remain ever unaffected and therefore blissfully ignorant of the truth, and that ignorance has a name, white privilege. It is white privilege that is the core of a century of dishonors of Yale, and why it remains an important work today. A couple of questions for you. Jackson wrote and sent a century of dishonor to Congress and the press in 1881, and five years later the Apache tribe was the last to surrender to American authorities. Why do you think contemporary American textbooks largely ignore, embellish, or falsify the truth about westward expansion and the atrocities against Native Americans still today? And what connections can you make between Jackson's allegations and warnings in Century and what may be happening today in America or elsewhere in the world? Could the lessons in Century help in these situations to bring awareness? I conclude that what happened to the Indian peoples of America in the 1600s through the 1800s was horrifically cruel, and no list here or in Jackson's work could account for its entirety. Jackson's goal was to bring awareness to the horrors inflicted on these people in the name of American prosperity, to educate the uneducated and to show us all the blood on our hands that we could not or would not see in a time of massive upheaval and change that was the Industrial Revolution and American Reconstruction. The times of these atrocities upon Indians may have passed, but what of other injustices that may be occurring today? How can we move forward if we do not learn from our history, account for it, and pass laws with that knowledge? What will motivate us into action as Jackson was motivated? How can we own the power of we the people rather than simply be we the people? How can we ensure a better America for our children? That's all I have for you in this presentation. I thought that the work A Century of Dishonor was quite powerful, and I think that it has a lot going on for it still today. And I am very glad to hear that it is still being used to fight for Native American rights.